This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the modern research platform for leading investors. Stretch your research budget with flexible expert calls you can trust. At a fraction of the cost of traditional expert networks, Tegas customers pay only what an expert charges with zero markups and no confusing call credits, netting an average of 70% savings. Don't want to conduct a full hour call? Tegas offers the ability to schedule 30-minute meetings, an offer you won't find anywhere else. And they don't stop there. With white glove custom sourcing for every project and robust compliance measures, including a dedicated 50-plus person analyst team that vets every call transcript, Tegas ensures your privacy and protection. As the industry innovator for qualitative insights, Tegas helps you find the right experts you need at a quality and speed that can't be matched. For a limited time, as a listener, you can trial Tegas for free by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down Dolby Labs. Now, this is a great niche of business breakdowns. Businesses that are widely known but barely understood. And when I first heard about breaking down Dolby, I thought to myself, well, here's a fascinating business. I see them everywhere. But with Apple making speakers, Google making speakers, Sonos making speakers, where does Dolby actually fit in? Do they need to exist? I knew Dolby was everywhere. At the movies, in my car. But I didn't realize Dolby is everywhere. It's in my iPhone, my Mac, my TV. So to break down Dolby... I was joined by Paul Vincent and William Knott from Asset Manager 91. We cover the backstory of Ray Dolby, someone who might warrant some more coverage. We cover what Dolby's actually building and selling, whether that's the technology, hardware, software, etc. And we cover how the business model actually works. So this is a fascinating story. And please enjoy this breakdown of Dolby. All right, Paul, William, welcome to Business Breakdowns. I'm excited to dive into Dolby today. It's a business that I encounter quite frequently in my car when I watch movies. But honestly, the extent of my knowledge is that I associate Dolby with sound. So maybe we can just start at the beginning. What was the problem Dolby originally solved for? And what was that original technology or product? Dolby's early history is really the life story of its eponymous founder, Ray Dolby. Ray was born in Portland, Oregon in the 1930s, and from an early age, was really fascinated by the science of sound. So in college in the 1950s, he started working at Ampex, one of those early Silicon Valley consumer electronics businesses. And aged just 22, he was actually named in the world's first patent for broadcast video recording. So a lifelong love affair, really, with intellectual property and sound had already begun aged just 22. Now, the legend goes, and this might be a bit apocryphal, but it's a good story. The legend goes that after completing his PhD, Ray was working in India with the United Nations. And while he was going on his travels around there, he got frustrated with the very audible tape hiss you could hear with cassette recordings at the time. That was a problem that was true across the industry. So while he was traveling back from India in 1965, Going back to London, he started to sketch out the idea of a noise suppression technology that would essentially de-emphasize elements of the recording that were impacted by this tape hiss. And when he got back to London in 1965, he set up Dolby Laboratories to commercialize this technology and therefore the company that we know was born then. Now, this early technology became known as Dolby Noise Reduction or Dolby NR, and it quickly became a de facto standard for audio cassettes. You would find it in the side of the Sony Walkman, you'd find it on audio cassette tapes, the logo was everywhere. And to use modern parlance, he found product market fit really, really quickly in the 1970s. 
And that was really just the first of many technological breakthroughs in the world of sound that Dolby would make over the years. And what are some of the well-known products that Dolby has today? So in the interest of simplicity, we'd segment Dolby's products into three key buckets. We start with the core audio codecs. These represent offerings such as Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, and AC4. These are the foundational audio codec, which are primarily channel-based and compress and split audio signals to be delivered from different speakers. The most basic example here is stereo, which differentiates between left and right speakers. But this increases depending on the setup to 5.1 or even 7.1. In simple terms, the core foundational codec are mainly applicable to the consumption of audio for movies and TVs, whether these are being viewed in the cinema, on DVD, streamed via services such as Netflix, or on cable and terrestrial TV services. The next key product we'd highlight would be Atmos. This is Dolby's next generation spatial audio offering. So instead of being channel based like Dolby Digital Plus or AC4 are, Atmos is object based. This allows audio to be created in three dimensional space using whatever speaker setup is present. Now, technically speaking, Atmos is not actually a codec. It's an audio format which embeds additional metadata. Allowing for spatial audio output is essentially to be rendered on the client side, resulting in audio which is more dimensional versus older channel-based codec, in the process being more immersive for the viewer. What's particularly clever about Atmos is it can be delivered via Digital Plus and AC4 codec, making it completely backward compatible, and this has effectively reduced the barriers of adoption. The really interesting thing about Atmos is it's thrust Dolby back into the forefront of music consumption. Now, this is where the company's historical roots come from with the likes of Dolby noise reduction from the 1960s. But over the years, Dolby has only really been able to monetize the music category partially through shared license agreements for the AAC format. Now, AAC had become the market standard file format for music streaming services. Atmos offers Dolby full ownership for the royalty income stream for music playback, while at the same time providing a sizable uplift to the royalty itself, which is something we can come on to discuss later. The final product to highlight is Dolby Vision. And this is a product worth discussing because it's the company's first foray into a visual codec. Vision is a high dynamic range or HDR imaging technology, which produces a more realistic image by expanding range. So in simple terms, it gives you a deeper contrast between your lights and your darks. Since launch in 2014, Vision has seen strong adoption helped by support from the likes of Apple and Netflix for the creation of their original content, which interestingly, they've adopted alongside the use of Dolby Atmos as well. And there are a few reasons why this is potentially exciting when we look at Dolby Vision. Firstly, Vision's a great product as reflected by industry heavyweight supporting it. Clearly expands the addressable market for Dolby to an entirely new category of codec where Dolby's not participated before. Like all of Dolby's new technology introductions, the royalty rate recovered or received on Vision is highly accretive to the overall rate for the portfolio. And the final point is what it potentially suggests for the R&D engine at Dolby. To believe in the investment case for Dolby, you need to believe the company will remain on the forefront of codec for the audio industry. The fact that Dolby appears to be doing this with Atmos while simultaneously driving the adoption of vision in the visual market is a really good indicator for the health of the business. Yeah, it's particularly interesting to think about a product that started with noise reduction, which I would almost categorize as improving a defect of the existing technology to now something like Atmos, which sounds like it's truly enhancing the overall experience and what's to come in terms of the visual side of things. What has been that path for the business and the important strategic decisions that they've made along the way? Yeah, it's interesting to try and draw that parallel between the Dolby of the 1960s and the Dolby of the 2020s, if you like. And I think what's important to know about Dolby's early days and Ray Dolby is, whilst he was clearly a great technologist, a great engineer, we actually think he was a pretty clear strategic thinker as well. And A number of business model decisions made in the 60s and 70s are actually still germane to the investment case today. And we'd highlight four in particular. So the first is that Ray wanted to sell pickaxes rather than mine for gold. And what we mean by that is early on, the business decided to license its technology rather than vertically integrate and become a manufacturer of consumer electronics. What this means is that you end up with much broader uptake of Dolby's technologies than you would have had otherwise. 
they became known as this trusted independent third party, an outside R&D engine that was benefiting the whole industry. And in return, of course, they earned a nice royalty for every unit that was sold carrying their technologies. And that is still the business model today. Dolby is a licensing-led business model. So that's the first business model decision. The second is Ray's fascination on and focus with protecting intellectual property. So early on, Dolby became known for being experts in the dark arts of patent protection. Again, that's something that flows through today and is an important competitive advantage. They have 17,000 patents, and that's a stockpile they're continually adding to. The third dynamic to think about is the importance of branded technologies. Dolby, when it was first launched, and we talked about the audio cassette market, which was its first market, you'll see they were pioneers in what we call ingredient marketing. You'll see the Dolby logo on the side of a cassette tape, and that is a signal of the quality. And again, this is apocryphal, but supposedly Intel, when they were deciding their Intel inside marketing strategy, those stickers you have on the side of laptops to show that they're powered by an Intel CPU, they actually went to Ray Dolby to talk about how they should implement that. So that's an interesting dynamic. And if you wind the clock forward to today, you log on to Netflix, you log on to Disney Plus, you'll see the Atmos or Vision logos next to the films or television shows you're going to watch. Same in Apple Music. If you're streaming music, you'll see the Dolby logo. You'll see it on the side of consumer electronics packaging. It's really about what you said at the start, Matt, that although maybe you don't know anything about Dolby the business, you know, it's something to do with high quality audio. And that brand transference is really powerful for the OEMs that carry that brand. The final dynamic is we think the most important. And that's where Dolby decided to levy the royalty in the value chain. So Dolby earns royalties every time a consumer electronic device is sold. They don't really monetize the producers or distributors of content. To bring it to life, if you go out and buy a $500 Sony TV from your local Best Buy, Sony are going to be paying a very small royalty to Dolby for using their technologies. But when you log on to Disney+, Plus, you're not going to be paying anything to Dolby, neither is Disney Plus, for when they're broadcasting in Vision or Atmos. And Lucasfilm, when they actually produced, say, The Mandalorian that you're watching on Disney Plus, they also didn't pay anything to encode the television show in that format. Now, why does this matter? It matters because Dolby is at the heart of a two-sided network effect. On the one hand, you have content producers, and on the other, you have content consumers. And what we know about these multi-sided networks is that they can be very powerful competitive advantages. One of the greatest business models of all time, Visa, is at the heart of a multi-sided network. The problem with them, though, is they have a chicken and egg problem. How do you get all sides of that network to agree to a new standard? And what Dolby did here is, we think, quite clever. They made the barriers to adoption on the supply side as low as possible. They really incentivized producers and distributors of content to use these formats. So the market gets flooded with Dolby-enabled content, and that spurs the demand side. It spurs consumers to go out and buy devices that can understand those technologies. And this two-sided network effect, we actually think, is at the heart of the business and is its greatest competitive advantage. It was true of noise suppression in the 1970s. It was true of Dolby Digital in the 1990s. And winding the clock forward to today, we think it's also going to be true with Atmos and with Vision. You've mentioned a couple times now, Ray Dolby, pioneer of sound and patents. And it's a really interesting theme and something that you've keyed in on. And we've seen it in other businesses as well. It was something that stood out to me when we did our business breakdown on Invisalign. You think about different barriers to entry for various businesses, and it's hard to overlook something like that, which plays such a key role. You tapped into a little bit of how they've gone about creating this two-sided network and really fostering adoption of it. I just want to try to understand a little bit better, how is the technology actually implemented? Is this part of an actual recording where it takes place? Is it part of some post-production? Where does the Dolby technology get implemented in terms of any audio file? So it's usually during production. But maybe let's just take a step back and explore what codecs are generally. So codecs, which is what Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, AC4 is, they're used to just digitally store and process real world signals. So audio, video, but let's focus on audio because that's obviously where Dolby's heritage is. To store sound digitally, we need to convert the kind of mechanical wave energy, the vibrating particles all around us that our brain understands as a sound into electrical energy. And that's all an encoder does. It's a piece of hardware or software that at the point of recording takes that analog signal, 
turns it into a stream of binary data, and that digitally records the audio. Now, at the same time, that encoder will typically pass it through a coding algorithm that will compress the size of it so that for broadcast or transmission or storage, it makes it a lot easier to handle that file. Now, if we want to play back that audio, we need to reverse that process. And to reverse that process, you need a decoder, which understands how that data has been stored, decompresses it, and then converts it back into a signal that our human brains can understand. And a device that does both, it encodes the audio at the point of recording and decodes it at the point of playback is what we call a codec or a coding format. Now, there are many, many different types of these. One famous one that I'm sure many people listening have heard of is MP3. So MP3 really revolutionized the way we consume music in the 1990s. It dramatically reduced the size of music files by over 90% compared to CDs. And with that allowed for the distribution of music via the internet and of course for playback on portable MP3 players. But what's important is that not all codecs are born equal. And for different use cases, you'll want to be using slightly different technologies. Some are far more intelligent about what parts of the audio to sample and therefore can deliver much higher quality at much greater compression rates, so allowing for things like broadcast television. Sound, frankly, is complicated. It's more art than science in deciding exactly what high-quality sound means. And Dolby's codecs, Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, AC4, and newer codecs like Atmos, they are regarded as market-leading for multi-channel audio, so surround sound. And as such, they've become these de facto, or even in some cases, de jure standards particularly for television and film playback. To key in on this a little bit more, I understand in terms of the file format and how that can play a role in terms of compressing something and then uncompressing it or shifting it back towards its original form. If I think about the microphone, what we're using today, does that restrict or enable any ability to record something that can be eventually translated using all of Dolby's technology? And I guess a similar question in terms of our recording software, if we're using something like Zoom or Riverside, does that play a role? Just in terms of where it comes into play in the process, are those factors in terms of what enables me or anyone else to use Dolby technology? They are factors. And it's one of the reasons why Dolby's codex, generally speaking, are used in professional contexts. The company's trying to change that up and make it more applicable for user-generated content. And that's maybe something we'll come back to a little later on. But yes, you do need specialized equipment, particularly for more recent formats. So Atmos, for example, which is an object-based standard, does require some specialist hardware at the encoding stage. But that's really important for us because what that means is that it becomes a closed loop. Once you've got the specialist hardware, you've created a file format that only Dolby enabled technology at the playback stage can understand. And that's where the network effect obviously comes from. If it was an open standard where anyone can record, but it was also able to be played back on any device, then that chain of logic would be broken. So yes, it is mainly for the professional market. It's for blockbuster television, blockbuster film, and it's also increasingly for music, as we kind of touched on earlier. We're beginning to see recording studios retrofit their equipment to allow for Atmos recording of music. And again, that's something we'll come back to a little later on because it's one of the interesting pieces of optionality within the business. Maybe we can tap into those different end markets. What does that look like today for Dolby? So the mix of the business has changed considerably over time. So if we roll the clock back to the mid 2000s, over 60% of revenues were associated with the core consumer electronic devices, which primarily represented DVD and Blu-ray players alongside home theatre systems. Now, as a result of the shift to other formats of media distribution, primarily internet-based streaming services, it's meant that the contribution from these devices has shrunk materially over time as optical drives have become less relevant in the world today. And again, back to the mid-2000s, PC was also a sizable contributor, representing over 30% of revenues. Now, this has fallen as the number of PCs and laptops with dedicated DVD drives has also declined. We've also seen other factors such as Microsoft Windows operating system. It used to include a royalty for Dolby Digital Plus. Now it only covers media streaming, not DVD playback. So in essence, what we've seen is Dolby's revenue mix mirroring the evolution of content consumption from consumers. What we've seen is TVs, for example, have represented a growing component of revenues as these devices have become smarter 
and require the ability to decode content via apps installed on the operating systems. So the film you watched on DVD two decades ago is now streamed directly to your TV via services like Netflix and Apple TV. Another growing component has been mobile, which represented a nominal component of revenues back in the mid 2000s, but accounts for around 20% of license revenue today. Apple's adoption of Atmos and Vision in the iPhone from 2018 onwards has been an important driver here. That brings us to the business as it stands today. In 2022, the breakdown was approximately 40% of revenues composed of the broadcast division, and that's mainly itself a function of TV and set-top box sales. 15% of revenues came from consumer devices such as home theatre systems, sound bars, and Blu-ray and DVD players. We've got 20% in mobile, 10% in PC, and then the remaining 15% constitutes a collection of end markets, including gaming consoles, automotive, and license streams coming from the Dolby Cinema-branded operations, which is a part of business we will dig into in a bit more detail later on. You mentioned a little bit there in terms of how a market like DVDs and watching videos has changed quite a bit over the past 20 years. If I were to just step back, I would think that previously Dolby would get a royalty or some payment for every DVD player that was sold, plus every TV that was sold. Is it as simple as in the market today, they simply just get a royalty for the TV that is sold? Is there any way to offset basically the consolidation of hardware that's happened over time? There has been some consolidation in consumer devices categories, DVD players, standalone DVD players is an area that's clearly been in structural decline. But we've had offsetting product categories on the other side of the ledger. So before you might have just had a laptop, now you have a laptop and an iPad. Before you might just had a TV, but now you have a TV and a soundbar. You might also now have smart speakers in every room of your house. All of those are device categories that can potentially earn Dolby some royalty streams. So for example, the high-end Alexa speakers, the high-end Siri speakers, the high-end Google Play speakers, all have Dolby technologies in them. The vast majority of all soundbars have Dolby technologies in them. So we see device proliferation on some areas of the market. We see device consolidation in other areas. The net result is we think that consumer electronics is still a growing, in terms of volume terms, still a growing market and therefore still a growing market for Dolby. Just to add to that, the other thing you also need to remember is the royalty rates are going up as they migrate the technology. So that's another offsetting factor which pales in significance if you go from a DVD player and an old style TV to a top of the range OLED with Vision and Atmos, the net benefit to Dolby from that transition is overwhelmingly positive. So you can't necessarily look at two plus two equals four. It's a slightly different equation from Dolby's standpoint. And can you share a bit more about exactly who the customer is? Is it the Discman component maker or the actual Discman maker, or even potentially the disc maker? Who are they selling to? So from a purely contractual perspective, Dolby's customer is the manufacturer of the device, whether that's going to be the TV, the mobile phone, or the PC. This is where the vast majority of license revenues are derived and where Dolby needs to ensure that the royalties paid match up with the actual number of devices being shipped and and sold. However, it's important to remember that this is just how Dolby chooses to monetize their IP and the benefits of products like Atmos and Vision accrue to the entire ecosystem. So maybe if we put aside the consumer benefits of higher quality audio and visual experiences, I think there are some really interesting financial implications for producers of both the content and the consumer devices from these next generation products. And maybe to bring this to life in a slightly exaggerated situational example, you're out to buy your next TV, you're in your local Best Buy, or maybe if you're like we are based in the UK, a chain like Richer Sounds. You're looking to pick up a TV for your living room. You're trying to understand the difference between a set which costs $1,000 or $1,500. Now, the salesperson explains to you a load of techno mumbo jumbo that you don't necessarily understand because you don't know the difference between OLED and LED anyway. Then he mentions the more expensive model has the latest technology from Dolby, which will give you a more immersive sound and visual experience. Now, you don't necessarily know what Dolby is, but you recognize the brand and this tips you over the edge for the more expensive model. In this instance, the TV manufacturer is as much a distributor of the Dolby brand as it is distributing the company's underlying technology. 
And what's important here is the manufacturer of the TV is paying Dolby a few dollars in royalties for that TV and then able to apply a very healthy markup when it sells the TV to the end customer. Now, let's keep going. When you get home, you do some reading. You understand that the combination of Atmos and Vision is being raved about online. People are saying it offers you an amazing immersive viewing experience. You do some more research, you find out that Netflix streams all of its original content encoded in Dolby Vision and Atmos. So great, you're a Netflix subscriber already. You log on to your Netflix account via your newly set up TV, only to find out that these formats are solely available to premium subscribers. So the monthly cost for Netflix premium sub is $15.99 a month. This compares to your basic subscription of $6.99. So having just handed over $500 more for the more expensive TV, you begrudgingly upgrade. But when you see the experience of HDR and spatial audio in your own home, that feeling is short-lived. Again, in this instance, Netflix isn't the customer of Dolby. They've simply gone to the effort of encoding their content in the market-leading file format. And in return, they've seen their subscription value double with a very high drop through to profit. Now, clearly, this is very simplistic. For example, Netflix premium subscription provides a much wider range of benefits than just Atmos and Vision. However, it does give you a sense of some of the ways that Dolby enriches the ecosystem within which it operates. And there are more examples. So Apple is both a customer of Dolby and a beneficiary on the content side. And this is most notable with Apple Music, which was an early adopter of Atmos in terms of content delivery. This is something that's often cited as a specific differentiator versus competing services like Spotify. This is where other ancillary upsells also come in. So for example, AirPods, which tout Atmos spatial audio as a premium feature, can only get that when used alongside Apple Music. So in this regard, Apple sits on both sides of the ecosystem, content and devices, and in the process has been an overwhelming beneficiary of Dolby's brand and IP. Do you have a sense of how big that market is for them today, some general TAM math or framework? Frustratingly, defining a neat TAM for Dolby is a challenging task. And the reason for that is that ultimately, their addressable market is the consumer's demand for high quality audiovisual content. And that could be film, that could be television, that could be music, that could be gaming, that could be user-generated content. And what Dolby does, obviously, is monetize that demand via the sale of consumer electronics. So they're basically taking a toll on the total consumer electronics market. Now, the consumer electronics market is vast. There's over a billion smartphones, and these are very rough numbers, but over a billion smartphones are sold each year, more than 300 million PCs and laptops, over 200 million televisions, over 250 million setup boxes and things like Fire Sticks and Roku's, over 100 million smart speakers. The list goes on and on. And all of these product categories could theoretically generate Dolby some royalties. So their TAM, if you like, their revenue opportunity is really a function of their value add that they can bring to that broader consumer electronics market. So hard to put an exact number on it, but the market from which they get a toll, consumer electronic volumes more broadly, is clearly vast. So there's plenty of runway for the business. Vast, and it seems to be growing. If we dive into Dolby specifically, how do you think about their own size and scale in the market, revenue, EBITDA, any KPIs or metrics which you find particularly useful for measuring the size and relevance of the business? So today, Dolby generates total revenues of approximately $1.3 billion. For context, this compares to around $400 million back in 2006 following the IPO. And while growth has not been linear, this translates into a long-term compound annual growth rate of approximately 7 to 8% per annum. Now, this is also a very profitable business, not really a surprise given the royalty nature of the business model. EBIT, in absolute terms, is approximately $250 million on a gap basis. Now, Dolby is fairly opaque in terms of tracking specific KPIs. Something that we view as important is obviously R&D. Dolby spends around about a quarter of a billion dollars annually on R&D. And I think there's a few things we can note here. Given the royalty-based business model, ensuring technological leadership is an imperative. Dolby's investments in R&D have been persistent regardless of the year-to-year -year change in revenues. So for example, there was no pullback in R&D spending during the difficult years in the early 2010s when certain consumer electronic license revenues were weak. In fact, R&D's importance in the P&L has grown. R&D to sales has increased from 8% in 2006 to 21% today in the process. 
absolute R&D expense has grown 14% per annum in absolute terms. And while a quarter of a billion dollars is clearly not a small number in any case, the fact that Dolby is focused exclusively on audiovisual codecs means this is actually an even larger barrier to entry compared to a more diversified company. One metric we can track from an R&D perspective is the patent portfolio. Currently, it sits at around 17,000 patents, and this is a portfolio that has grown at a KGAR of almost 20% over time. And importantly, based on our analysis, it looks like the average duration of the patent portfolio has also been increasing over time. So in practical terms, Dolby's patents stretch out to around 2046. The final point I'll make with regards to R&D is you could almost characterize Dolby as a centralized R&D function for the audiovisual industry. It makes much more sense to have a single business working towards the continued evolution and improvement of codec technologies, and the homogeneity of standards is a huge benefit for everyone inside the industry. And just to clarify that one point on the R&D budget, that comes after EBIT, is that correct? The EBIT of 250 is inclusive of that R&D spend, absolutely. Oh, it is inclusive of the R&D spend. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was a capitalized number. Okay. So completely changes the dynamics if not all of the EBIT is flowing back into R&D expense. And that explains a lot of the additional expenses that go into the model. That's why those are the interesting questions to ask. You've tapped into the royalty pricing model a few times, and we've beaten around the bush a little bit. Can you outline what that looks like, how that's changed over time? and the important dynamics that make up the royalty pricing model? So a recurring theme with Dolby is that disclosure isn't great. There's always a little bit of guesswork going on. And unfortunately, I'm going to give you another slightly vague answer, Matt. So as we know, Dolby's core revenue model is licensing its technology to third parties. They go incorporate that into products like smartphones, TVs, game consoles, sound systems, whatever. And in return, those manufacturers need to pay a royalty every time they sell a device. How is that royalty decided? What's the royalty pricing mechanism? It's commercially sensitive. So Dolby doesn't give us much help here. They don't give us straightforward answers. What they will say is that it ranges from cents to dollars. And if you were to really force me and say, okay, well, what's the rough rule of thumb? I'd say probably something like a dollar per device is the average royalty blended across all the different product categories. And importantly, that differs depending on the nature of the implementation, the mix of technologies that are being used, and then also volumes, because they're very heavy volume discounts as well. So Atmos and Vision in particular are very important growth drivers because they will be materially accretive. We don't know the exact number, but materially accretive to that average royalty rate. So a high volume, highly concentrated product category that is using relatively basic Dolby technologies will on average have a lower royalty. And this is why we think, for example, the smartphone category, high volume and concentrate in the hands of just a handful of OEMs, Apple being the 500 pound gorilla. That's why we think royalties on smartphones are probably the lowest across the different product categories. And on the other side of the ledger, a lower volume, less concentrated product category that uses richer technologies, so uses Vision, uses Atmos, will have much higher average royalties. And that's why we think The TV market, for example, will be at the top end of that range, more like a few dollars compared to smartphones in the kind of cents range. That $1, if I just step back and think about pretty much all of the devices or products that we've referenced, none of those are really sold for under $100. Many of those are multiples of that. So Dolby as a percentage of the overall sale is sub 1% of the sale of any product. Is that a reasonable rule of thumb to think about? It's difficult because obviously ASPs vary a lot, but I agree completely with the thrust of your question. If you're buying a $500, $1,000 TV and Dolby's maybe getting one, two, maybe $3 for every TV sold, this really isn't a material impact for the OEM. And something Paul said earlier, I think is important to remember, the OEM is getting benefit from incorporating Dolby technologies. Yes, they're the ones having to pay the royalties, but the consumer recognizes the Dolby logo, recognizes its relevance to high quality audio. And so they're actually able to usually price up. So what we typically see when Dolby introduces new technologies or tries to attack new product verticals is there's a bit of a kind of S curve for adoption. So they start in the very high end models. And if you wind the clock back five or six years ago, Atmos and Vision were mainly on the $2,000 TV sets. And then over time, they kind of percolate down. So that's usually their go to market. And we'll come to it later, but 
automotive is an interesting example of a much higher ASP category that they're looking to attack. We'll save that for later because I think that's an interesting bull case for the stock. Yeah, I have Dolby logo slapped into my car. They get really excellent real estate. You mentioned it before across various products. It's impressive that that's a piece of the sales process as well, making sure that they're featured. I wanted to tap into one of the markets we've referenced a little bit, but has certainly undergone some issues. It's one that I think about Dolby originally being associated with, which is movie theaters. Is the structural uncertainty, potential terminal decline of that industry a serious threat to this business? So you're right that the movie industry and cinemas broadly used to be a very important part of the Dolby business model. So in the 1990s and the 1980s, selling equipment to those cinemas was a big part of the business. Today, it's not. So licensing accounts for 93% of revenues and substantially all of gross profit. It's about 99% of gross profit. Now that remaining 7% is product sales and services. And most of that is selling equipment to cinemas. In addition, there's some other bits and bobs in there, mastering services for Hollywood studios. There's other forms of support and consultation for content creators. But most of that product sales and services is the sale of equipment to cinemas. If we were undergoing a structural decline in the cinema market, that 7% of revenues is under threat, but the profit contribution from it is essentially zero. So we're not particularly worried if that part of the business is in terminal decline. Now, there's one other part of the business where cinema exposure does pop up, and that's within the licensing side. So within the 93% of sales that come from licensing, Dolby does earn royalties from its branded cinema experience, which it calls Dolby Cinema. And if you haven't come across it, it's a lot like IMAX in many ways. So to be very clear, Dolby is not a cinema operator, but what they do is they sell specialized Atmos and Vision playback equipment. They set the specifications in terms of seating and screen. They leverage their brand, and then they operate those screens in partnership with the actual operators. So AMC, for example, is one of their big partners. And in return, Dolby earns a percent of all the box office receipts that are generated from that screen. And there's something like 260, 270 Dolby screens globally now. The majority of them are in the US. And as I say, AMC, for example, are, are a big partner of them. We think Dolby Cinema accounts for probably low single digits percent of licensing revenue. So it's not a material headwind if that is also part of the business that we think is structurally challenged. What I would say, and this is particularly true post-COVID, is that actually the cinema market is probably bifurcating. Legacy kind of mainstream offerings with those dated seats and small screens and tinny sound from, that haven't been updated since the 1990s, that's probably not an experience that the consumer is super pumped to pay for, particularly post-COVID. But actually premium cinema offerings, and Dolby Cinema is arguably the most premium of all, have actually seen a really strong rebound post-COVID. And the growth rates pre-COVID were also strong. So we actually think there's quite an attractive outlook for that part of the licensing business anyway. How do you think about the cyclicality of this business more broadly? It sounds like there's certainly a large component which is tied to consumer devices. There's some GDP or GDP plus element to it. There's other end markets which have their own dynamics. How do you think about what this business looks like from a cyclical perspective and how that's really trended over time as well? So we need to make the distinction between cyclicality and product cycles in the end markets, the consumer electronic markets that Dolby supplies its technology to, and then also the product cycles within the Dolby portfolio of Codex itself. We start with the end markets. Look, consumer electronics through which Dolby monetizes its IP are inherently cyclical. These are discretionary purchases in terms of their nature, and therefore will ebb and flow with the economic cycle. That said, there are a number of considerations we need to overlay here. Firstly, there is considerable diversity in the range of devices that Dolby monetizes its license revenue through. While that doesn't necessarily reduce cyclicality per se, it reduces the risk of being overexposed to the economic impacts on a single category of devices. Within this, we also need to think about the impact of different product cycles. So if we wind the clock back to the mid-2000s, Dolby was growing revenues over 20% per annum for a number of years from kind of 2005 onwards. This growth was being driven by the adoption of optical disk drives, by primarily those included in DVD players and PCs. Notably, this growth was despite the negative impact on consumer electronics from the financial crisis. So I think this speaks to the point that product cycles can overwhelm broad economic 
weakness. I guess the flip side of that is by the early 2010s, the market for optical drives was becoming saturated, meaning Dolby was entering a period of digestion. The positive here is that while royalties associated with DVD drives were in decline, Dolby was seeing accelerating adoption of its IP in new use cases. So these included those embedded within TVs, which were increasingly becoming smart for streaming services, as well as those royalties that were growing from the mobile phone market. So these were two offsetting forces, which were something of a wash from a revenue standpoint. Now, Dolby didn't ultimately return to a level of consistent mid-single-digit revenue growth until around 2016 throughout this entire process. The situation we find ourselves in today isn't completely dissimilar, although somewhat nuanced. So consumer electronic sales are coming off a relatively strong period of demand following the pandemic, particularly the broadcast segment, which captures royalties associated with TV sales. It's probably no surprise a portion of excess consumer saving during the pandemic, coupled with stimulus checks, found its ways into consumers upgrading their TV sets. Now, the air pocket in growth that this has created has also been exacerbated by general economic weakness in recent periods. So this has been a sizable headwind to Dolby's core foundational license revenues for codecs such as Dolby Digital Plus and AC4. The positive here is that Dolby is benefiting from another type of product cycle. While during the 2010 to 2016 period, it was a few broad-based categories of consumer devices picking up the slack when optical drives began to rebase, the forces today are much more specific to Dolby, primarily in the form of Atmos and Vision adoption. So growth in these next-generation codecs has been plugging the gaps over the past 18 months, leaving revenues kind of flat to slightly down at a total company level. However, it kind of seems only a matter of time before base foundational stabilizes as electronic device sales normalize, at which point Dolby will benefit from the full effect of Atmos and Vision adoption from a total revenue standpoint. So that's a very meandering path I've taken on there, Matt. But maybe to circle back to your original question, how cyclical is Dolby? Well, I think this depends on the level of maturity of the business vis-a-vis the level of ongoing innovation. An entirely mature Dolby is ultimately offers you a royalty on consumer electronics volumes, which would be undeniably a cyclical income stream. However, this is not the Dolby of today, as the business continues to invest in moving the industry to the next generation of codecs, which both expand use cases and increase royalty rates. So we'd expect this factor to significantly dampen cyclicality in Dolby's revenues over time. That makes a lot of sense. You mentioned the general EBIT margin profile around 20% before how capital intensive is this business? Obviously, a lot of that is including an R&D budget in it, which we clarified. But you know, in terms of CapEx or any type of free cash flow dynamics, what does this look like for the business? So maybe starting off with a bit more detail on the margin profile of the business, and then we'll tackle capital intensity. But Dolby's licensing business model makes it attractive from a margin and a cash flow perspective. So at a gross margin, Dolby generates a 95% margin on its license sales, although at a group level, the gross margin has pulled down a bit to around 88% due to the lower margin products, primarily those relating to equipment for Dolby Cinema. And now this naturally provides ample opportunity for reinvestment further down the P&L, and Dolby certainly does that. So we've already discussed the high levels of reinvestment into R&D, which is currently running about 20% of sales. The other large cost buckets to think about is firstly sales and marketing. This is also sizable, so Dolby spends around 28 to 30% of sales here. And this investment is particularly relevant today, given we are still in the fairly early stages of mass adoption of the next generation codecs we've talked about. And we're also seeing on top of that expanding use cases. So this cost bucket primarily reflects Dolby's direct sales force, which both manages the relationship with device manufacturers, content creators, while also promoting the brand and technology at trade shows, conferences and other industry events. The final bucket is G&A, which normalized is around 17% of sales and primarily captures central costs. I think it's fair to say Dolby's more bloated cost structure is best reflected here, and we kind of struggle to see why that couldn't be a bit lower over time. But when you add all of that up, you get to this EBIT margin currently of around about 20%. And notably, this is the gap margin, so it fully accounts for stock-based compensation expense, which is there and it is a real cost to us as shareholders. Thinking about where this margin could go on a prospective basis, 
We could argue that this is a trough point in profitability for Dolby, given we've got the combination of current market weakness in the core foundational business, while the company continues to spend aggressively on R&D and sales and marketing to progress the adoption of the next generation technologies. And if we look back at history, this is a company that has reported an equivalent margin in excess of 50% at EBIT level. Now, this was, to be fair, in the early 2010s, around the time of peak sales of optical drives for DVDs. Now, at this point in time, the business was growing 20%. And no surprises, given the high gross margins Dolby has, it benefits from sizable operating leverage. So from our vantage point, when we think about the margins on a go-forward basis, we kind of think they end up somewhere between where they are today and where they have been in terms of those peak margin levels. As it relates to capital intensity, look, this isn't a capital intensive business. Dolby is very cash generative. Cash conversion is typically around 100% of earnings through time. CapEx to sales, which is very little of that, is any capitalized R&D expense typically is in the 5 to 6% range. And actually, I think this overstates the capital intensity of Dolby at maturity because it includes some ongoing investments as they roll out the Dolby Cinema offering. Interesting point there in terms of potential operating leverage. And when you have that type of gross margin opportunity to take on the overhead costs that exists. And I think you mentioned a little bit there with SGNA and where you might see that come into play. I want to talk a little bit about risks, threats to the business. I have some general questions or some particular subjects, but would be curious to hear your views first on what the major risks are here for Dolby. So maybe we'll start off with a more technical risk, which is line of sight on revenues. This isn't a business which gives you a best-in-class line of sight like you would with a best-in-class software company. And I guess this isn't a threat per se, but more a downside of the business model and something we've debated a lot amongst ourselves. So due to the license-based business model and diversity of devices that now incorporate Dolby's technologies, it's quite difficult for investors to have a clear view of that shorter-term progression of revenues. This issue actually is magnified a little bit by accounting rules, which require that Dolby estimates device shipments, then uses true ups quarter to quarter to adjust revenues based on shipments formally reported by its customers. And while these adjustments are quite small, they create quite a lot of noise that amplifies that quarter to quarter volatility. And then on top of that, if you overlay the cyclical elements of device sales, it does create some challenges in predicting the shorter term. So Potential investors in Dolby need to have their eyes open on this point. It's just the nature of the business model. I mean, that said, I think you need to consider that alongside Dolby's incredible market position and, of course, the continued rollout of new technologies. So this potentially means your conviction in the longer term prosperity of the business over the coming decade is maybe that bit higher, but we'll let others decide on that. So that's kind of risk one. The second one is probably more existential. And it relates to the very nature of licensing business models. Licensing business models have a few notable benefits, not least the very high gross margins associated with a product with no direct marginal costs. This does increase the risk of your IP being abused. So to a large extent, Dolby is reliant on customers declaring and paying the right royalties when they use the company's IP. And, you know, as Dolby doesn't produce a physical product, they don't have anything they can withhold from customers in response to any such abuse. So when we think about obvious examples of problems occurring with licenses businesses, the immediate example that springs to mind is Qualcomm. They saw a few years ago customer disputes with customers based in China, disputes with Apple, where customers are refusing to pay royalties relating to IP used in smartphones. And at the same time, Qualcomm was kind of fighting an investigation by the FTC into anti-competitive business practices. There are quite a few reasons why we think Qualcomm is an extreme example and why we feel relatively comfortable with Dolby, despite a similar business model. So firstly, we think there's clear alignment of interests within Dolby stakeholders. So this comfort primarily stems from the relatively nominal dollar royalty rate that customers pay to Dolby. So Matt, to your point earlier, less than 1% of a product's ultimate sale price is going to Dolby in terms of royalties. And that feels very reasonable to us. You compare this to Qualcomm, which was charging a percentage royalty based on ASP of the device sold, and you can kind of see a stark difference in approach there. Another factor is there's a complete lack of conflict of interest in the way that Dolby 
manages its relationship with customers, operating almost exclusively as a provider of IP, which benefits the entire industry. Now, again, if we go back to the Qualcomm example, they were simultaneously licensing their IP whilst also selling semiconductor chips to the same industry and then using this as a tactic to negotiate more favorable terms, which was part of the FTC complaint. And then finally, when we look at Dolby's customer concentration, it's relatively low. So no one customer represents more than 10% of sales. And we also have this diversity in terms of device types. All of that together means, yes, we acknowledge licensing business models carry some risks we need to be aware of, but we do feel they're relatively appropriately mitigated as much as possible within Dolby's overall business strategy. Historically, when there's been releases of something like Alexa, other smart speakers, what stops an Apple or an Amazon or a Google from just producing this technology in-house? I suppose it goes back to two things. The first is the patent protection. And I suppose this is both a benefit and a risk. Dolby has 17,000 patents that protect them from direct competition with their technologies. We know that's a risk as well. And we've seen businesses that rely on IP. The pharma industry is probably the most notable that when they do roll off, you're exposed to potential competition that can come in and compete on price. We think that element is actually fairly well contained for Dolby for three reasons. One, they've always done a really good job of extending protection windows. That kind of cliff is always moving further out. Two, they always migrate customers fairly successfully to newer versions of technology. So Dolby Digital is actually mostly off patent in the majority of markets. So they've rolled those customers to Dolby Digital Plus or AC4 and Atmos. So they've done a good job at also migrating customers to newer technologies that, again, extend the protection windows. And the final point is around branded technology. This isn't just that it delivers superior audio. It's that it has positive brand transference for the OEM. So that element above and beyond the technology is, is an important consideration for someone looking to cut Dolby out. But to go back to your question, though, remember the closed loop that, yes, Sonos, Alexa, someone else, Apple could go out and say, hey, we've got a competitor to Atmos. It's as immersive as Atmos, but it's our own proprietary format and we don't have to pay those royalties to Dolby anymore. Well, Apple then needs to go and convince the content producers to actually encode their latest films, their latest television programs in those formats. And then they need to convince the distributors that those are the right formats to use. Now, the thing is with someone like Apple deciding to try and introduce those formats into the ecosystem is that no one trusts Apple. Everyone presumes Apple is looking after Apple, which they rightly are. The thing is with Dolby being someone outside of the actual manufacturing process, their trust is an independent third party that yes, you have to pay royalties for them, but they then offer that to the entire industry and they're not trying to create an ecosystem that just benefits certain manufacturers. That's why we see someone like Apple, who it's fair to say are known for being pretty aggressive with their supply chain and can be quite sharp elbowed with competitors. They are wholeheartedly supporting Dolby in, in everything they do. They were early adopters of both Atmos and Vision. And what they're doing with Apple Music is really opening Atmos up to an entirely new market as well. So we think that is actually a very strong indicator of the value of Dolby's technologies, even to a company as sophisticated and commercially savvy as Apple is. And when it comes to visual, this feels like a pretty big step for a company that has historically been in audio, something that shouldn't be necessarily glossed over, that it's extending maybe beyond what they've historically had as a core competency. How much of the bull case or how much risk is there just in terms of investing into visual, pushing into visual? Is this a really important inflection for the company in terms of if visual does not catch on, does not work? Is that a major risk for this business? How do you frame that? It's now a very core part of the bull case. So I'll sketch that in a moment. But we think vision is actually already quite far along in terms of becoming a new standard in the same way that Dolby's audio codecs and Atmos are becoming standards. So vision competes against other HDR formats. There is a open source format called HDR10 and a, another one, a kind of successor technology called HDR10+. Plus. They, although they don't attract royalties, have struggled to see the same kind of uptake that Dolby vision has. And the reason for that, again, is it's place in the ecosystem. Dolby does a great job at helping content producers and distributors understand the value of the technology, make sure they're using it correctly and make sure they're distributing it correctly. 
when you're open source, you don't have a kind of quarterback playing that role. The other thing is that HDR10 Plus is mainly sponsored by Samsung. And we have the same kind of problem that we described earlier with Apple, that Apple, for example, refuses to use HDR10 Plus because they obviously compete with Samsung in the smartphone market and in other adjacencies. So because of that, any format that is introduced that has the backing of a major manufacturer, people presume there is a competitive edge there. And that's why Dolby is so uniquely placed to introduce new formats into the industry. Now, the bull case more broadly, I think, let's sketch it out. So in a nutshell, the bull case is that Atmos and Vision get to the same kind of penetration rates that the foundational audio technologies are at today. So Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, they are pretty much ubiquitous across product categories like TVs, PCs, smartphones. And today, those foundational audio technologies account for about 70% of sales. We think that grows low single digits through cycle. And the reason for that is that penetration rates are pretty much capped. So they can go maybe a little bit higher, but they could slip in other categories. So we think it's a wash. They're pretty much where they will be. Royalty rates for those foundational technologies are also flat over time. So really all you're getting is that index on volume growth. And through Cycle, what we see is that consumer electronic device volume growth is kind of the low single digit range. So that's the growth rate in 70% of the licensing business. Where things get exciting is the other 30%. And the other 30% is a combination of Atmos and Vision. So these newer technologies. And they're growing much faster. And the reason for that is that penetration rates are much lower at the moment. Dolby being Dolby, we don't have great disclosure on this. But what we do know, for example, is at the end of fiscal 21, Dolby Vision was on something like 20 to 25% of 4K televisions. So call it low to mid-teens of the entire TV market. And again, we don't know the exact number, but we do know that Dolby Digital and Dolby Digital Plus are on north of 50% of all TVs worldwide. That's something that Kevin, the CEO, has said. And actually, it's substantially higher in Europe and in the US. In Europe and in the US, close to every TV will have either Dolby Digital or Dolby Digital Plus. And so Dolby Management have kind of pointed to this Atmos and Vision opportunity and said, well, actually, it's going to be at least as big as foundational audio in the fullness of time. And we think it can maybe grow 15 to 25% per year for the next three to five years. So if we take low single digit growth in 70% of your licensing sales, and let's call it 20% growth in the other 30%, you put those together and you actually have line of sight for Dolby accelerating to potentially low double digit top line growth. And that's something the business hasn't actually achieved in a very long time, not since those kind of heady days of the DVD cycle. Now with 95% gross margins and what we think should be a fairly fixed kind of operating cost base, you can see that that significant latent operating margin potential should start to really kick into action if you're growing at that sort of clip. And as we discussed earlier, in that kind of 2005 to 2009 period, we saw 20 percentage points of EBIT margin improvement, 30% to 50%. And look, we don't need to assume anything close to that this time around. And that's not what we necessarily think the business could get back to. But even if it's just somewhere along that curve, you can see, begin to see that there's quite exciting earnings potential in the business. So that's the bull case. Now, where things get really interesting for us is the cherry on top, and that's the opportunity in automotive. Dolby technologies historically have been used in the car, but not as widely as they have in other product categories. So they're heavily used in the kind of back of the car. So if you have a kind of entertainment system in the back seats, you'll see usage of Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus. But usage in the front of the car has been a lot lower than it is in other technologies. And the main reason for this is that Dolby Digital and Dolby Digital Plus aren't typically used for encoding music and radio. That is all changing with the adoption of Atmos in music. And now suddenly it makes a lot of sense for auto OEMs to really have the ability to play back Atmos in the car. And just in the last few years, we've had a number of announcements from Dolby in terms of OEMs that are introducing it across their models, Mercedes, Volvo, Polestar, Lucid, Lotus, just to name a few. Now, how big is this opportunity? Let's have some fun and let's paint what we think is a fairly blue sky scenario. But we have three variables we need to forecast. The first is the market size. So rough numbers, there's something like 70 to 80 million passenger cars are sold each year. That was a kind of pre-COVID number. It moves around a bit. Let's just call it 80 million for the purposes of this exercise. Second, we need to work out the penetration rate. Where does Dolby Atmos get to? Now, Kevin, the CEO, says... He wants to see Dolby in every car in the world in the same way he wants to see Dolby in every TV, every smartphone, every sandbar. So let's just assume they can get to 50% in the fullness of time. So they can get half of that market. 
The third variable, of course, is the royalty rate. We don't know it. Dolby's not going to hold our hand on this. We know it varies from cents to dollars. But what they have said is that the royalty rate will be materially higher for automotive than it is in other categories. As we were talking about earlier, a $50,000 car is not the same as a $500 TV. So let's just say for the purposes of this conversation that they can get to $50 royalty. And actually as a percent of ASP, that would actually be lower than it is on a kind of typical TV. So 50% penetration of a 80 million unit market with $50 royalties, we're talking about a potential $2 billion licensing revenue opportunity. And that's on a business that today is doing $1.3 billion in revenue. Potentially very, very exciting. Now to be very clear, we're very early on in this journey. And this is really a source of optionality but it's a pretty exciting form of optionality that we think sits on top of what is already a fairly attractive base case. It would certainly be a nice cherry on top, I think, when you outline those numbers. I've learned a ton here as a self-proclaimed audio man. There was way more to audio that I didn't understand and a lot of great takeaways, learnings. When you think about looking at this business, we always close with what lessons can be pulled out and applied for investors when looking at either this investment or other investments, what would you key in on here with Dolby for lessons? So for me, it's the merits of investing in family controlled businesses. So Dolby's a controlled company. The Dolby family still have something like 35% economic interest, but because of the split share class structure, it's something like 85% of the combined voting power. Ray's son, David, is still on the board. And I think Sometimes investors shy away from those types of businesses. Clearly, minority shareholders have very little ability to enact change at Dolby. I think it's fair to say the company's disclosure and communication with the market is not where it would be if they didn't have a controlling shareholder. Maybe their cost structure wouldn't be, we'll use the word bloated, let's just say well-invested. Maybe it wouldn't be so well-invested if they didn't have a controlling family at the helm. But we think on balance, this type of ownership structure is a strong net positive for a business like Dolby. Dolby has survived waves of technological disruption over its long history. The digitalization of cinema in the 1990s, the shift towards streaming in the early 2010s, they really had an impact on Dolby's revenue model. And yet each time the company's come through that and come through it stronger. And if there was a management team at the helm with shorter term horizon that was more interested perhaps in margin preservation during those periods, we think the business will be in a lot worse shape than it is today. And actually having that ownership structure with an intergenerational focus of compounding actually means that management can take those long-term views and make investments in technologies like Amos and Vision, which didn't pay off for the first few years, but we're now seeing some really nice incremental returns on invested capital. And maybe to add one from my side, I think Dolby is a great case study for the benefits of strong stakeholder alignment. Stakeholder analysis is a big feature of our research process, and we believe good alignment can provide much higher confidence in the persistency of long-term cash flows. And as Will has explained, Dolby has been extremely careful and strategic about the way in which they monetize and price its IP. Now, this has created an industry dynamic whereby large consumer electronics companies have championed the company's technologies. So we shouldn't understate the point made earlier about Apple's willingness to actively promote Dolby as a brand. And that's a very, very, very unusual situation. And this dynamic has only come about because pricing relative to value delivered is so fair in Dolby's instance. Well, Paul, William, this has been an excellent conversation. Again, I have learned a ton about Dolby and the broader technology behind it. Thank you very much for joining us on Business Breakdowns. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 